So this is it for us in Ephesians. Tonight is the last teaching um, for our book of Ephesians study that we've done. And um, I hope you found it as wonderful as I have. I love I love Paul's writing style. I love what he was saying to the church, the church in a, in a location where the Roman Empire was opposed. I love what this study has meant to us. I've seen a lot of people growing in their faith, asking great questions, and really digging in. I'm so thankful for our devotion team that has been writing devotions and providing devotions to, to the church um, the different members of that team and really making it happen so we can dive into the words. And the sermon-based small groups, if you're not in one, you really missed out on this leg because this is, this was a great chance to dig into Ephesians as sermon-based small groups because Ephesians is a thick book. It's rich. Theologically, it's very practical. And tonight, we lean into the practicality, the, the way this works itself out in real time. When Paul deals with the church in Ephesians chapter 6, he really mobilizes them. And when I say mobilize, I want you to think with me like, um, what does it mean to mobilize an army? You gather them together. You get the objectives very clear on what their purpose is. And then you, you set them up to go and take ground that they don't currently have. Paul mobilizes the church in the Roman Empire to um, advance the true kingdom of God. Really, the, the underlying tone of this is in Rome, the quote would have been, Caesar is Lord. This is Paul shot across the bow saying, no, 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 Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord, and the church is mobilized to declare it with their living and the way that they transform into the image of Christ by the Spirit and live into this identity of being a Christian. So tonight we look at mobilizing the church, but what we have to understand and we need to take a moment to do is understand the idea of what Paul's doing at the end of Ephesians is a bit of a battle cry. Um, it's, it's one of those things where um, maybe we don't have a lot of it nowadays, but um, one, of the, one of the best examples of a battle cry that I've seen in, in modern times taking place now to kind of mentally psych out an opponent is a thing called the haka. If you've never seen the haka, you're about to. It's a Maori Polynesian dance the warriors would do from Polynesia, New Zealand, and the Maori warriors, they would do it. Check it out real quick. That's where I'm like, oh, I forgot my diaper because <laughs> I'm not fighting that. <laughs> That's not happening. Um, the dude with the dreads, isn't he especially frightening? Like, I just look at him, I'm like, no, nope, I'm playing tennis, mom and dad. That's terrifying. When somebody's like, yo, I'd be like, no. <laughs> you know, it just, it's such a good intimidator. And um, that's the New Zealand All Blacks. And they are um, the, the New Zealand uh, national rugby team. Those dudes are fierce. I mean, they know how to get with it. And that Maori war dance was actually done as a battle cry in ancient times right up till now. And they do the battle cry in order to psych out their opponents. And you notice at the end, they were kind of doing a good imitation of Gene Simmons from Kiss with their tongues hanging out. And they're like, yeah, you know, doing this. Actually, one of the things they were doing was um, trying to kind of convey the message, we're crazy, and when we're done beating you, we're probably going to eat you. Like it was, they kind of had that crazy look in their eye where like, you know, it's like if you're going to get in a scrap with somebody, you, you might scrap with somebody, but if they got crazy in their eye, you're like, it's good, I don't need to fight, here's my wallet. Like that's kind of what they had going. That battle cry evokes this thing that says, you are not only facing battle, but We've come to pick a fight, as William Wallace once said. We are leaning in with this. The Apostle Paul utters a battle cry out of the back chapter of Ephesians, and it calls the church to a mobilized, focused effort to be who they were created in Christ to be. It doesn't mean it's not terrifying. It means you need courage. Courage not to be your best self, but courage to allow the transformation of the Holy Spirit in your life to transform you into the image of Christ. It's a thing that Paul writes about, and he says it really interestingly. He uses terms that everybody in Ephesus would understand. He, well, let's read it. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God, so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, 
against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. I'm going to stop there tonight, and I want to, I want to talk real quick. Look what Paul says in this. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. That means if you're my enemy, you can't be human. Why? Because every human being was created in the image of God. Every human being that you don't like is still dearly loved by God. Created in his image, you may not like him, but you're called to him. Your enemy will never be a person. Your enemy will always be rulers and the authorities against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Demons. Satan. That's who Paul's talking about. Therefore, Paul says, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then. Get that? It's, It's just stand, stand, be present, be engaged, put on the full armor and be there. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. Pray also for me. Paul says, that whenever I speak, the words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Paul was in prison when he wrote this. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. I just want to point out, we often take saints of old like Paul and Peter and we we like to super saint them, right? They just, I don't know, they, they just were better than us. They weren't. I want you to notice what Paul said in this. Pray for me that words may be given to me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly. Why do you think he's saying that? Do you think maybe Paul was a little afraid knowing that he's in prison, the emperor is Nero, and what Nero's done to Christians has haunted the ears of Christians throughout the Roman Empire? Paul knew what laid ahead of him. He knew it would be difficult. And he said, pray for me. Pray for me that I may be courageous enough to declare fearlessly the mystery of the gospel and that I would do it courageously as I should. I've been called. Pray for me that I'll be brave enough. Paul was human like you and I. When he penned that letter, what we need to understand is there's this fearful aspect in Paul's writing that says, I've got a hard road ahead. Pray for me. He goes on to give some final greetings. Um, I totally forgot how to pronounce that word. Guy whose name starts with T. The dear brother, I said it twice yesterday, but it just left my mind. The dear brother and faithful servant in the Lord will tell you everything so that you also may know how I am and what I am doing. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage you. Peace to the brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. The Apostle Paul ends this book in this beautiful, well, it kind of fights back against that fearless, fearful narrative, an undying love, a love of Christ that died our death so that we would live an undying life, a life that continues into eternity. And we look at what Paul wrote and we say, how does this call the church to be mobilized? What did Paul do and what was his language that really kind of gave us the understanding of what was coming next? I think it's interesting how Paul wrote this because if you know of Sun Tzu who wrote The Art of War, anybody ever heard of that? The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Um, it's, it's this book that breaks down the understanding of how to wage war effectively, uh, logically, but also engaging the emotion and the moments you're in. And the, the author, uh, Sun Tzu of The Art of War, wrote this in such a way that I think you can actually kind of like transpose it over what Paul's saying and see throughout this whole text that um, we're called to live the art of war. 
one of the one of the parts of the art of war, one of the one of the tactics that Sun Tzu employs is this: to know your enemy, to know your enemy. Remember what I said earlier. You are not enemies with any human being. We are not enemies with any other church in this town. We are not competitors with them. We love our Reformed, our Baptist, our Catholic, our Lutheran. We love anyone who confesses Christ as Lord and Savior. Our enemy is not a Muslim. It is not a Jew. It is not a Buddhist. Our enemy is one who has no physical appearance. It's the devil. It's Satan. It is never a person. And so we need to know our enemy. So if you're fighting against one another, you're fighting the wrong battle. We should know our enemy. And if we're going to know our enemy, we need to also understand that our enemy comes with tactics. And we need to know what the enemy's tactics is. Since our enemy is the adversary of old, the devil himself, and his demons, we need to know what are his tactics, what has scripture given us to let us know who the identity and the the behaviors of our enemy. How does he fight? Well, he doesn't fight fair. First of all, he's a schemer. The devil is always looking for an inroad to get in through a side door or a window of your life or a little crack in your life and get in there and do damage on the inside, divide you from people. He's a schemer. He's a terrible schemer. He's an accuser. The devil will never let you rest with your past. Because I'm guessing you, like me, need Jesus to be our Savior. Because I know this. If it were up to me being a good Christian, I would not get into heaven. Just period. If Jesus Christ wasn't exactly who he said he was, and his death and resurrection, without that, I don't get into heaven. I'm not good enough. And Satan does a great job of accusing me of my past failures. And I'm assuming the enemy of your soul has done the same thing to you. He's done the same thing to you over and over again. He's also a slanderer. He loves to slander people. Satan doesn't have an um, integrity issue. He can slander people whether it's true or false. And his slander is one of those things that seeks to do what? Divide us from one another. To get suspicious about one another and different things. We get suspicious about what's going on with this little group of people that maybe we were friends with once, but now, what are they doing now? We're not in the group, and are they talking about us? And he slanders. He slanders other people. He slanders your character, their character, the church's character, and Jesus Christ. He slanders. He speaks untruths all the time. Most likely, he speaks half-truths most of the time. He puts a little sprig of truth in and he just kind of dresses it up in such a way that slander, your character gets maligned. The final thing is this, he is a liar. The devil is a liar. He has lied since day one. Read Genesis 3. He misquotes God intentionally. He implies God's character is broken and flawed. He lies constantly. He will say things to you like this, oh sure, you got over that addiction, but you know, well, I mean, you're you, right? You'll never get better. You'll never get better. You're a failure. You're a loser. You're weak. You're stupid. You'll never succeed in life. Why don't you just settle down where you're at and not make any noise and embarrass yourself? You're worthless. Nobody wants you here. You know what? This world would be better without you. He lies constantly. He lies to us constantly. He is the one who seeks to destroy our soul because Satan's pleasure is doing anything that harms God and God loves us with an unending, undying love and it was proven in the person of Jesus Christ who Paul talked about. So we need to know the enemy of our soul and his tactics as a schemer, an accuser, a slanderer, and a liar. But we also need to know that he uses camouflage, right? And we... Like the innocent little deer of the forest in the fall, what joy is this? A pile of corn. And they they see it and they start to eat. Why some camouflaged cretin is above them with a bow. A tank, you know. Next thing you know, Bambi's between bread. Oh, oh, you know. He camouflages what you don't see can kill you. Right? And trust me, I'm a hunter, so don't, don't get me wrong. I enjoy the hunt. But it really plays out well for us to look at it that way. What looks so appealing and draws us in is actually his camouflage to destroy us. It leads us to destruction. And we need to know his camouflage is quite often the way he disguises his behavior through each other. 
We will do foolish things and make sinful mistakes. And he maximizes those opportunities. When I make a mistake as a person or I see you in the grocery store and you smile at me and I'm like, "Eh," or I just don't even smile, I'm just in my own head. And you're like, my pastor hates me. (laughs) Eric is a jerk. He doesn't smile at his own sheep. Right, and you you come up with this thing, and you go tell other people, and you're like, you know what? I saw him in the store; he doesn't even smile. I mean, does he think he's better than us? And all of a sudden, the division comes. I maybe didn't even know I saw you. I was looking for arugula. <laughs> right? I maybe didn't know what I was. I, I maybe I didn't know, or maybe I see you and I smile. I'm like, hey, no, all right. And we just keep going, right? And you have this moment where you go, do you not like me? And Satan camouflages himself, and then he gets in between relationships, and he slanders, and he lies, and he accuses. And the next thing we know, we're going, you know what that person did to me one time? And the answer is nothing, absolutely nothing. But you believe the lies of the devil, and his camouflage has forced you to fight against someone God dearly loves. We can never be at war with one another because we are not enemies. Our enemy is the sworn enemy of God, the devil himself. So we need to understand his camouflage is he often uses us to hide behind. So if you're in a conflict with someone, I implore you to prayerfully seek out the truth and seek out reconciliation because his camouflage would cause you to hate one another. And Jesus Christ said, they will know, the world will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. The next thing is, we have to be prepared. Sun Tzu would say, not only should you know your enemy, but you should be prepared to meet them in combat, right? You should be prepared in order to engage them in combat. Because if you walk out onto that rugby field with a tennis racket and shorts that are a little too short, and you're like, hey, guys. And some guy's like, ooh, ah. And you're like, oh, ah. Oh, wait. No, I don't want that, right? You've come ill-prepared for a violent beating. They're going to they're gonna hurt you, right? You're, you're in the wrong place with the wrong gear to do the wrong job. We need to be prepared as the people of God on God's terms, not ours. And God gives very clear instructions to us on how we do this. Now, this next section of what we're going to do is going to feel a little heady. It's supposed to. It's supposed to. And I want you to lean in with me as we talk about the different ways we prepare ourselves. First of all, the belt of truth. It's actually called, in the Greek, it's called athalia. It means truth, but it actually goes a little deeper than that. It means what can't be hidden. This word stresses the undeniable reality when something has been fully tested and will ultimately be shown to be a fact. The belt of truth. What is our truth? That Jesus Christ wasn't lying when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. We better have that wrapped around the center of who we are. We we put that around the middle of us. And the belt of truth attaches everything into one cohesive unit. The belt of truth, it stresses, truth stresses the undeniable reality of when something has been fully tested and will be shown to be a fact. Our faith is being fully tested all the time. And it has, for two millennia, been shown to be a fact in the life and witness of the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it comes from truth. We better know what we believe when we talk about God. We better know what the truth is. That God isn't a mountain that everybody gets up by their own religion. You don't get there through Hinduism and Islam and the different religions. You just don't get there. You get there through Jesus Christ. It is truth. It holds everything together at the center. And we need to understand that the the, the belt of truth actually has this loop on it in Roman armor. And what does that, what does the scabbard hold? But what? The sword, which is the word of God. The word of God speaks of the truth of Jesus Christ. The word of God has, the truth of God has attached to it its witness, which is the word of God. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. We have the spirit of truth living within us. We have to be people who learn to discern and believe not only what scripture says, 
but it's calling on our lives to transform this world by participant faith in wearing the truth we believe openly on the outside. The next thing we know is God gives us this breastplate of righteousness. He says in the scripture, put on the belt of truth and then the breastplate of righteousness. This is kind of a cool one. If you're a medical person, you might hear this word and think, oh yeah, the, the word of it um, for the breastplate, it, it starts out, it's called Tharaka. Isn't that kind of a cool, it sounds like an 80s rock band, doesn't it? Yeah, Tharaka, you know, but it's actually, it's actually where we get the term thorax. And your thorax is right here, the, the ribs, um, and your, your main breastbone here. And it says, put over your thorax, put over the center part of you, this protection, guard your heart. So it says, over this middle part of you, God has already physically put in your rib cage and your breastbone to protect your organs. But put on something more. There's this, um, this reality, and there's another Greek word that I'm not going to bore you with, but um, it, it's, it's, you've got your thorax, but then it talks about what covers it, and it describes a covering that protects the very thing that is in conformity or unity with God's own being. Protect the part of you that is in conformity, being made into the image of God's own being. And it makes you upright. If you think of a, uh, an armor chest plate, you know, like Batman has an awesome ch- armor chest plate, and you put that thing on, it's not like you can slump over with it, right? Because it's, it's stiff and it's rigid. It keeps you upright. Our heart, the thing that is most, our inmost being that is in con- being conformed and transformed into the image of God by the Holy Spirit, it is protected, but it also, when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, it's protected and we stand a little taller. Our witness comes out. If you look at a lot of Roman armor, there would have been an insignia on many of the pieces of armor right on the chest plate of who they represent, the legion or the different things. What we need to understand is the breastplate is what allows us to stand upright, knowing what we believe, but also knowing that we love the Lord Jesus Christ. And in our hearts, we're being transformed into his image. And we need to protect that against the enemy. Against the enemy who seeks to knock us down. Do you ever see anybody fight laying down? Unless you watch MMA, that's kind of, they do that there, but that's a little janky for me. But um, most of us, if we get into a scrap or a scuffle, we're not going to be like, oh, let's fight. And we lay down and get at it. You know, that'd be weird, right? Nobody does that. The breastplate actually allows us to stand up. Stand up with our heart protected and lean into the battle God's called us to, to push back the darkness that seeks to occupy the hearts and minds of people all around us. We have to be people who stand upright in our faith and we're not ashamed and cowering and hiding that which is being transformed, but also we have a breastplate that says we protect it, we are protected by God, but we also march forward with our shoulders back and our head set on God's calling for our lives. We know we must guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus for every good work that God's prepared for us. Paul wrote that in another book of the Bible. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is the way you guard your heart. You literally ask God, cover my heart and guard me and protect me. Conform in me, change me from someone who always wants to rebel to someone who is conformed and soft and tender like a piece of clay and can be bent into your image, not into mine. Next thing is this. We have our feet fitted. There's a really cool reality with this. This is spoken in the past tense. When Paul says this in the Greek language, well, the Greek phrasing here is used all past tense, which means this. Your feet are were made ready to take the good news to the world around you. You have been prepared, now obey and go. It's not optional. Like you gotta put on the breastplate, you gotta do these different things, but your shoes are on if you're a Christian. You have the good news, you have the gospel, you are made, the wheels are on, it's time to use them. Your feet are fitted, it's past tense. If you have come to Christ, the good news is yours, and it's bound to you. And you are called not to sit in a static lifestyle, but it's on your feet. Why? It's an image of forward moving. It's past tense. Your feet have been fitted. 
It's not present tense, your feet are being fitted. And it's not future tense, be real good and God will put the gospel on you. That's not what it's saying. It's saying it's already done. It's already done. Your feet, you have the good news. Take it out. March forward and obey with this. Obey the command of Jesus Christ. Go. Go into the world and testify of me. The gospel is bound to our feet. But in contrast to our feet being fitted, past tense, is the present tense calling to the church to take up the shield of faith. This is an active reality. This is very. Uh, this is a verb, okay, the Greek verb. And, and it's saying, pick it up. And it's got a, another kind of cool name, the alabantes, the shield. We, we take it up. It's not something you're like, you know, you're in a fight and you're like, sweet, I got my shield laying on the ground next to me. That's not how it works. You actually have to exercise the muscle of faith. You pick it up and you believe in Jesus Christ and you believe in his redemptive claim over you and you hold fast to who he made you to be, not who you were broken and redeemed from. You were a broken soul before you met Jesus, like I was. But the reality for you and I is we have to take up the shield of faith and believe that this tool is to be held up actively. And one of the cool things about it is it says that the the nerd, the the word, the alabantes, it means to take up, to raise up. It's an active participation, and it's ready and in hand indefinitely. It is always there. The shield of faith is always with you, always on your arm. It's an indefinite time period, right? It's one of those things that like, it's like, I don't know, it's like signing up for Amway. You're going to get soap forever, right? This is one of those things. You take up the shield of faith and you do so indefinitely. There's no point in your life where your faith isn't the principal means to deflect and stop the accusations, the lies, the slander, and the efforts of the devil. Your shield is the very thing you hold in front of you, and it quenches the flaming arrows of the devil. It quenches the flaming arrows of the devil. And we have to hold it up, trusting that our faith will do what it is designed to do. Our faith in Jesus Christ, first and foremost, his life, death, resurrection, but also in his calling on your life. You have to have faith that Jesus Christ intends to use people as broken and messed up as us to march the kingdom forward. Faith that God has a purpose for your everyday ordinary life. And even the little things we do matters. We take it up because the devil will say to you, you have no purpose in this life. Look at you. You are just a hot garbage fire. Sit down and knock it off. And you'll be like, you're right, unless you hold up the shield of faith and you say, no, I know this. According to Scripture, I am a new creation in Christ. And because I'm a new creation in Christ, the old has gone and behold, the new has come. And the flaming accusation of the devil is kind of like, And Peter's out into the shield of faith. But we've got to hold it up. We need to know who we are in Christ. Because we already know well enough who we are in our own power and in our own life. The shield of faith stops the accusations. It stops the, the reminders and the deadly truth of who you were. It also quenches the lie of who you're meant to be in the devil's eyes. We have to hold it up. And we have to fearlessly defend that which Christ died to save, our life and our purpose for the kingdom of God. The next thing we have is the helmet of salvation. I like the helmet on this picture with this menacing metal man here. I like the helmet of salvation because it it has some cool meaning in the Greek. It literally translates to receive a helmet, to have a defender. This is my favorite. The salvation of your mind. Isn't that cool? Pick up and put on the salvation of your mind. Here's what we know. Mentally, neurologically, we make choices. Let's talk about me and potato chips for a minute. There's a neurological pathway to those salty, golden gifts from the ground. I love them. They are a root that I adore. I like them fried, salty, and dipped in ketchup. 
I will eat them off the floor if you're not looking. I find them delightful. I had tater tots at lunch and chips in the kitchen when no one was looking. I love potatoes, right? There's a neural pathway that says, Eric, when you eat these, you feel love, <laughs> right? My brain's going, I'm going to stop working because things are going to start bursting if you don't stop loving potatoes. There's a reality that my neural pathogens, and I have, I have this, this thing in me that if I'm sad, my wife knows this, I'll be like, just have a sandwich or something. Why? Because for me, for some reason, comfort eating happens. It's a neural pathway that's an unhealthy way of dealing with something, and I believe this. I believe that Jesus Christ, and I was, I was joking, I didn't like wolf down a bunch of potatoes. I was using it for an, an example, but um, we need to understand that Jesus Christ died for our sin to be resolved, but he also put around our minds salvation. And your neural pathways can be conquered by the Holy Spirit living within you. If you have an addicted pathway and, you, and you, all of a sudden something happens and you feel that, that neurological path to the bottle, to the screen, to the shopping, to the gossip, to whatever it is, whatever feeds that monster inside of you, you need to know this. The helmet of salvation should be put on by Christians. And we should pray as Paul wrote, Lord Jesus, guard my heart and my mind in you for every good work that you have prepared for me. And literally, I don't care if you look crazy, when you are in that moment of temptation, I want you to be like, it's all right. I'm doing it. I'm putting on the helmet of salvation because I can't win. And when you lose the battle mentally, you know how quick you are to give in. But if we claim that, no, we have been given the salvation of our mind, that those quick neural pathways can actually be dammed up like a, a dam on a river and hold back the behaviors of our past for the new and purposeful life we're called to in Christ, we actually experience the salvation of our mind. The neural pathways change, and we find meaning and purpose in things that aren't addictive and destructive to our lives. We have to be people who understand the helmet of salvation is calling us to be saved, well, from everything Paul talked about in Ephesians. Paul said this, what are we saved from when we come to Christ? From every, sex, every sexually immoral desire, from theft, robbery, drunkenness, slander, gossip, we have a bunch of new ones that we've made up, but they're, you know, new versions of the old thing. And I think it's good. And I think it's amazing that God gave us a mind protector. I think it's really neat that God gave us a mind protector because we get into a lot of trouble when we're left to our own devices, right? What, boredom is the devil's playground, I heard my mother say, right before my brother and I built a bomb. <laughs> right? And kind of blew my brother up. I'm like, oh, that's stitches. Right? You know, you're like... Seriously, we have a mind protector. We have something that is the salvation of our mind. Don't you believe that your mind is owned by your addictions, your past, or your brokenness? There is a salvation of your mind, and it is yours to put on, to be prepared to face the enemy who knows where we're weakest. The sword of truth, it literally means to make war. It is our offensive weapon. Now, your shield can be used to kind of lean in and push back. If you think of the phalanx formation, you can push back with your shield. But the sword of truth means to make war, to engage the enemy. But we engage the enemy on God's terms, not ours. And this is the critical reality. If we're going to engage the enemy on God's terms and not ours, we need to understand that when we talk about the sword of truth, what is truth and what hangs from the belt? Jesus Christ is truth. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What is he saying? All Scripture points its way to the cross and to Christ. All Scripture is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for training. We need to understand the Word of God is our only offensive weapon. It is our primary means to cut to ribbons the evil that seeks to lurk in the corners and jump into our minds and lead us astray. The Word of God is the reality of what we need to be speaking. We need to speak the Word of God back against the temptations that come our way. We need to speak the Word of God proudly as students of the Word. Would joy and gusto speak back to the devil the Word of God? 
not our own ravings of not again, but we need to speak back the word of God and we understand that this is our response. This is the response God gave us. Jesus Christ was tempted in the wilderness after 40 days with no food and first temptation was bread. And what did he say? It is written. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus believed it worked, and he was the word. And the devil had to be like, oh, you know, he steps back, so he takes Jesus to a high hill. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, bow down and worship, I'll give it to you. And what does Jesus say? It is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Oh, I mean, literally, just cutting the devil to ribbons. So the devil takes him to the, the temple. He shows him the temple. He says, jump, for it is written that God will give his angels concerning you authority to protect you so that you won't even stub your toe when you hit the ground. And what did Jesus do? He corrected the devil's misquote of Scripture. And he said, it says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus quoted the book of Deuteronomy, and he smacked the devil like he had Thor's hammer in his hand. He knocked him out of the universe. He could not deal with it. The devil ran away and went and waited for another opportune time to tempt him. That's what Scripture says. If you want to know how we fight evil in our minds, in our hearts, in these places, we quote the Word of God, and here is why. The Word of God is more than just our rule of faith, but it is our rule of faith. It is the standard, but it is our source. It is our response of strength, and it is our defender when the enemy is close. You don't, throw, you don't have a sword out if somebody's 100 yards away. You have a sword out when somebody's in your face. It is our defender when the enemy is close. And God has poured into his word power, authority, and strength. And we are called to take it up and use it with skill and with integrity. And integrity matters because I've heard a lot of Christians use scripture to beat one another up. Be mindful. You are not my enemy and I am not yours. We don't use Scripture to win arguments. We use Scripture to proclaim the kingdom of God forward and cut through the darkness as we march ahead, marshaled, mobilized as the army of God. Remember that our enemy is not flesh and blood. We must have integrity when we use the Bible. So we have the Word of God. The Psalms teach us how to pray, how to sing, how to talk with God honestly. But Paul goes on to give us a few secret weapons. And he says this, pray. Just pray. Pray all the time. Verse 18, all occasions. Pray on every occasion and ask for anything and everything. Just pray. Pray on all occasions, which is more than breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's pray. Pray about everything and pray for God's people. Verse 19, pray for me, he says. Pray for me. And then verse 20, pray that I'm able to preach fearlessly. Pray for me. Pray for the people of God. Pray for all occasions. If you want to know what puts the devil to flight, it's the word of God and the prayers of his faithful saints. Praying in faith that Jesus Christ does have a plan in spite of the accusations and the slander coming at us about who we were, what we can never do, and how we're a failure. We have to be people of prayer. Paul calls us to it. And he says, pray for one another. Pray continually. And pray that the gospel will be made known fearlessly. I know you're afraid to take the gospel into your workplace. It's not popular anymore, but that doesn't change our calling to be mobilized and marshaled to the task that we lean in and we push back against the darkness. So for us, we have to, we have to apply this quickly in two ways. Instead of asking, do you accept that there's an, enemy, there's an enemy, I want you to just understand, there's an enemy of your soul who seeks your destruction and your life to be purposeless and pointless. There there is an enemy. His name is the devil. He has demons, and they seek to undermine and lie about the character and truth of God. Understand there's an enemy. You know his tactics. You know his camouflage. Understand that there's an enemy, but also, remember Sun Tzu? Know your enemy. Understand he's out there. Understand he'll remind you of your past. Understand what he'll do to undermine your confidence. But your confidence is never in you. It was always in Jesus. You didn't save your soul. You didn't save my soul. He saved us. Our confidence is in him, whom the devil can't touch. 
Our confidence and our identity and our purpose is rooted not here, but in him. So when we understand that we have an enemy, we also need to understand we have an advocate. We have a savior. And we have the almighty creator who has called his church to stand up and push back against the darkness. Understanding that our enemy will lie, cheat, and steal. But Christ came to redeem all that was lost. He will do it through your life. Not through its perfection, but through its transformation. The next thing we need to do is understand that we must be prepared. I have tried, probably in my broken way, the best I can, to to talk about how we are prepared as the people of God. To display the gospel in the way we gear up and go to war. But we go to war not in our own power. We go to war because Jesus Christ loved us. And he not only called us to step into the fight, he armed us well that we could be the people of God for the purposes of God in our own broken world. May your lives speak of the transformation of being equipped for the purposes of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are and the work you've done. We pray that you would come and speak in such a way that our lives would be transformed. God, thank you for loving us who are so broken and lost. May our lives speak the gospel in the way we lean in, the way we gear up and step into the life you've called us to, to take the gospel and go into the world. May our lives be lives stepping in and going, therefore, into all the world. Wherever you've called us, wherever you've put us, may the gospel be bound to our feet. And may we be protected by you, God, our armor, our hope, our salvation. Redeem in us what is broken and bring to life in us all the purposes you've knit in by the power of the Spirit. We love you, Lord, and we give you thanks for the love that you've given to us. Help us to grow in how we express it back. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing. This was Paul's last letter to the Ephesians. These were his last words. Go. Gear up and go. Take the fight to the enemy. And that's our benediction tonight. Take the fight to the enemy. You know the armor you're given. You know you're called, purposeful, redeemed. Live as such. If you need to, put on the armor. In the morning, just get up and say, God, guard my heart. God, guard my mind. Help me use your word appropriately with integrity to take the gospel forward and transform the world around you. Here's how I know transformation happens. When people of another culture come in and change a culture, I've seen it happen when I was looking up a haka dance, um, the, the thing we saw earlier, I saw my high school's name on it. Now, we didn't do the haka at Helix High School when I was there, but um, there's a number of young men from Samoa and the Polynesian Islands and Tonga and Fiji, and so I watched it, and there's like, there's Helix, there's my, you know, my my boys from Helix, and they're all there, and they're like, ooh, and I'm like, oh, I was born too soon, that's awesome. We didn't do it when I was there, but some people came in and said, let's do war like this, and now Helix gets out on the field and does the haka, and I'm super jelly about it. I really wish I could, but it'd be weird. I'm middle-aged, right? What if we started taking the fight out and we said, no, no, we're going to fight for those whom God loves. We're not going to fight against them. We're going to fight for them. And we change the world around us. We do it by one faithful act, by one obedient Christian at a time. Go and live under that calling to change the world, not by your power, but by the power of the one who called you his own. You are a Christian. You bear the name of Christ. Live as such, and as you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the church must leave the building. My friends, you're dismissed.